last week we were talking about, I, I was mentioning that uh, sometimes in the past there had been an attitude among certain of the Catholic population that um, we were the only ones who were going to be saved, we were the one true religion. And it reminded me of a show that I saw many years ago called Late Night Catechism. Did anybody ever see that? It was a very funny one woman show by a woman who was dressed up like an old time nun and she went through many routines of spoofing all the way a sister used to strike fear into our hearts. But um, there was a Q&A with her afterwards and um, she was actually quite, quite up on religious doctrine. So somebody said, um, sister, if I'm, if I'm not a Catholic, do you really mean that I can't get into heaven? And she said, well, our Lord did say that my house has many rooms. So yes, there will be a room for you. But yours will be next to the elevator and the ice machine. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's a tough one. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> okay. That's. And we also mentioned um, Henry Ford and some of his, his history last time. Did anybody ever hear of Henry Ford's dealings with the Goldberg brothers, who were the inventors of um, air conditioning for automotive? Yeah. Anybody ever hear that? Fascinating story. Four brothers, Hiram Lowell, Norman, and Maximilian Goldberg, were um, young men growing up in the Midwest and they worked in war production in the, in the plants out in the Midwest when they were making tanks and airplanes and all those things rather than automobiles during the war. They were very smart guys and they realized that when the war was going to be over automotive production was going to be starting up again and that people would really want an air conditioned automobile. So they um, devised uh, a prototype air conditioner, they bought an old car, they installed it got it working, and then they waited. Then the war was over, production started back up again, and they talked their way in to see Henry Ford. They said they had a very revolutionary uh, invention for him. So they get in to see him <coughs> and uh, told the secretary what it was all about, so they persuaded Mr. Ford to come outside. They had waited until a very hot day, and uh, they asked him to get into the car. He got into the car and then said, okay, please get out. Then they turned on the engine, let it cool off for a few minutes, let him sit in once again, and Henry Ford was dumbfounded. He said, I'll give you $3 million for the patent right now. And Hiram Lowell Norman and Maximilian said, no, well, well let's, let's talk about that. We want to make some money, but we want some recognition too, Mr. Ford. So if you agree to put our names on every car you make and have it uh, say air conditioning by Goldberg Brothers, uh, we'll sell you the patent for $1 million. So Henry Ford thought about that. And he didn't really like the idea for obvious reasons. Uh, so they seemed to be at an impasse, but they were good businessmen. Hiram Lowell, Norman, and Maximilian were good businessmen. So was Henry Ford. So they negotiated and they finally compromised. The brothers Goldberg, Hiram Lowell, Norman, and Maximilian agreed to sell Henry Ford the patent for $2 million. And he would put only their first names on the dashboard of each car. And that is why, even nowadays, when you and I go out to our car and turn on the air conditioner, we see whether we want high, low, normal, max. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, today we're going to talk uh, talk the Holocaust in miniature. We'll talk about it in one city and uh, how it affected one woman, or actually uh, uh, one woman and her family. Um, the lady's name is Mary Wygodsky, the lady for whom I'm, uh, with whom I'm uh, working on a memoir. So these are 
our topics for today. We'll, we'll get through the Vilna section first, then I hope we can take a break. Then I'll talk about Mary and how she um, was able to survive. She survived three camps and uh, is now out still as a spokesperson today. She's 93 years old and, um, and still alive and kicking and as, as feisty as ever. Um, and we'll start with a trivia question. Can you tell me the exact geographic center of the continent of Europe? So this is a final Jeopardy answer. It's the, city. Hmm? it's the city of Vilna. This is Vilna here. If you draw a line up to Spitsbergen in the north, and I don't know what's, what's in the south, the Canaries out here, the Urals over here, the line will intersect right at Vilna. So that's, uh, this is where we'll be talking about much today. We'll also be talking a little bit about Bialystok, which is the uh, native town of Mary's husband, Mort. Where's, He's, the, where's the capital of Lithuania? That is correct. That's, uh, this is 1939-40. It was not, oh, not, the capital, not the capital of Lithuania at that time. It is, so it's Vilnius. It's Vilnius now. now. Okay. Yeah. Right. So this is, um, this is the line of demarcation after the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Russian influence over here, German influence over here. And uh, <coughs> this is, you can see how close Vilna is to the, um, the demarcation line, but the, the Russians um, had sway there. They had sway also in Bialystok. And even after the, um, the, the Germans invaded, they invaded over that line and then drew back. So this is a little bit of history on Vilna. It is the center of Europe and it's been known by all these many names depending on which country was in charge of it. And the Jewish folks have always been there and they'd, uh, they'd called it Vilna. But if it's uh, Vilno, when it was Polish, this is what the Russians and French call it. The yellow Russians, that's the same thing there. And the Lithuanians uh, called it Vilnius. It was a, uh, it's a, uh, it was a pagan realm surrounded by Christian lands back in the, the 1300s. And they did eventually uh, convert to Christianity. Um, and actually, um, one of the things that I, I, I wanted to do before we began, uh, so I'll, I'll back up a little bit. I want to just start by reading a poem by a man who's the author of this book, uh, Herman Kruk, K-R-U-K. I'll, I'll be talking about him a lot uh, in this. This is a diary uh, he wrote after coming to uh, Vilna from Warsaw. He fled Warsaw when the Nazis arrived there. He arrived in Vilna. He was a, a librarian and a writer and he chronicled just about everything that happened uh, day by day in Vilna. This, this, it's a little bit difficult reading. There's not a lot of narrative to it because it's a day by day account of what, what goes on but it's an, an indispensable history of Vilna. And he ended up um, being exiled at the, uh, at the end with the, after they liquidated the Vilna ghetto. He and about 2,000 other guys, including some relatives of Mary, were sent to Kluga in Estonia, where they worked under brutal conditions for about a year and a half, building fortifications. And then when the Russians were closing in, the Germans killed them all, burned the bodies on a, on a pyre, and then, and then left. I had a, had a picture of it last time around. But um, this, this poem was written by Herman Crook, and it's... Uh, I posted it on my, uh, my online page for Holocaust Remembrance Day last week, and it's, it's really quite touching. Neighbors in Camp Kluga often ask me, this is a translation of the poem that he wrote in Yiddish. Neighbors in Camp Kluga often ask me, why do you write in such hard times? Why and for whom? But we won't live to see it anyway. I know I'm condemned and awaiting my turn, although deep inside me burrows hope for a miracle. Drunk on the pen, trembling in my hand, I record everything for future generations. A day will come when somebody, find, somebody will find the leaves of horror I write and record. People will tear their hair in anguish. Eyes will plunge into the sky, unwilling to believe the horror of our times. And then these lines will be a consolation for future generations, which I, a prisoner, kept in my sights. Things I recorded, fixed faithfully. For me, it is superfluous. For future generations, I leave it as a trace. Let it remain, though I must die here. And let it show what I could not live to tell, and I answer my neighbors, maybe a miracle will liberate me, but if I must die, it must not die with me. 
He's a very eloquent, learned gentleman. Okay. Okay, so here we're, here's our topic. Where and were again, his found? pardon me? Where were his writings found? He, um, he, he, he hid them in, in various places. He, he stashed some in Vilna because he, was a, he uh, was a librarian and he was on, a, um, on the mission to, uh, under the auspices of the Germans, to uh, ship a lot of the Jewish artifacts out to Berlin for the museum of the vanquished Jewish race that the Nazis were setting up. Because he, he, he knew what was the valuable Jewish stuff, so he was the, the captain of that team. So he had access to libraries and some secret hiding places. He hid some there, he hid some up at Kluge. Not all of it was found, but enough of it was found. Put it in, in things like soda bottles. You know? And but this this is I forget how much this costs. It's a pretty expensive book, but if you're seriously interested in history, it is well worth it. Okay, um, just uh, I'll, I'll go through uh, quickly some of the history of Vilna. Um, the rule of Gedeminus in 1325 to 1341 uh, was corresponding with, with the then Pope John about converting to Christianity. Um, they, they negotiated. It was it was kind of like. I don't know, maybe, maybe it was like uh, Trump and the guy in, in North Korea. They didn't really believe one another. And nothing really came of it. The, uh, the Pope wanted to get a, a, a bigger foothold up in Northern Europe. And the people, the local people wanted to rid themselves of the Knights Templar who were Catholic, nominally Catholic, but they kind of ignored the Pope and did what they wanted to do. And, uh, you know, get, get a minus finally blew the Catholics off and, and uh, he went his own way. But he was, he was their first... Uh, big prestigious ruler. Uh, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was a, was a pretty big place, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and the Kingdom of Poland. There, were, uh, uh, there was a, a marriage between, uh, let's see, the Queen of Poland married the Grand Duke of Lithuania in 1386. And that, this big country, big prosperous and powerful country was formed. And it lasted actually until the Polish partitions under the Tsars. The, uh, the capital of Lithuania was Vilnius, and that, that really had a hold on the, the Lithuanian people, even down in the, the days of World War II. They wanted their country back. They wanted their capital back. They didn't get along with Poles. They didn't get along with Jews. Uh, but there was their, uh, their attachment to their country was one of the, the deep motivating factors for how they behaved during the Holocaust. Uh, let's see, and they, the, uh, the Jews uh, pretty much kept to themselves. Uh, we, I, I did read some passages from some travelers uh, last time about how the Jews were, they, they made all the, the commerce of the, uh, of the Commonwealth run, basically. They were the, they were the innkeepers, they were the, the, the ostlers, they, uh, they pretty much they handled all the money. They, uh, they were the artisans, but they did not have a lot of political power as a group, so they were apart. They also made uh, good, Denver, uh, good uh, moonshine. Good, they did? Yeah, I didn't realize that. First class because okay. of their laws. Mm -hmm. Really? Okay. Makes sense to me. Okay, now this, this is uh, St. Casimir, the um, patron saint of Poland. Christianity did take hold up there. Um, when they, they tried to um, make for closer ties between the Kingdom of Poland and the Holy Roman Empire. They try to marry off uh, Prince Casimir to one of the, uh, the, the daughters of the Holy Roman Emperor to, to cement the alliance. I and mean, that's the way they did business in those days. Casimir just would have none of it. He was, a, he was an ascetic. He wanted to go off in his room by himself and pray all the time. They, they tried to get a beautiful woman in to seduce him and he would have none of it. He ended up dying very early. Okay, so that, that didn't work. About, uh, that's 1484, then in 1520, they're still playing political chess, and they needed, the Pope needed a political base up there, so he sends a guy named Ferreri up to broker a peace between Poland and Lithuania and the Teutonic Knights. Ferreri goes up there, tries to negotiate it, and um, it took him a month to travel up to Vilnius. And it's usually a very tough traveling uh, arrangement. Weather is always terrible, but he said he had really good luck with the weather. It never rained when he was on the road. 
So that was the miracle that he could attribute to St. Casimir. Casimir became the patron saint of Poland and everything was great. That's, that's how you get to be a saint in those days. You, you needed evidence of miracles to be a saint. So that's, hey, we'll, we'll make Casimir our patron saint. That's how he got to be the patron saint of Poland. Okay. That's the way they did it. All right, now this is um, the partitions of Poland uh, happened under the czars the, and, and um, uh, Metternich and uh, uh, those other guys were in on it. Um, so after Poland was partitioned, uh, Catherine the Great restricted all the, the travel of all of her new Jewish subjects. She had about five million Jewish subjects. They, she had none before. She, they re restricted them to this, this area here, the Pale of Settlement. And that was both a good thing uh, and a bad thing, uh, in, in a sense, because it allowed the Jewish culture to flourish, the Yiddish language developed. Um, they, they became, a, you know, uh, within their own area, a very prosperous and learned society. And Vilna was pretty much the nerve center uh, of Jewishness. There were restrictions on professions. They, they couldn't be, uh, let's see, what were they? Um, 38.6% uh, of the Jews uh, of that area were in, uh, in commerce. Um, no, 72% uh, of the people engaged in commerce within the Pale of Settlement were Jews, and 31% of them uh, were in, in crafts. So they had restrictions on the professions they could follow as well. Um, the 10 largest communities were Warsaw, Odessa, Lodz, and Vilna was the next. Uh, Warsaw had 219,000. Uh, Vilna was around 64,000. Bialystok, 41. So there were, there were some, some very big and, and prosperous <coughs> towns there. But um, it, it really is the crucible of Jewish culture. This is where much of Jewishness that we, uh, we know it today came from. It, it developed up there uh, in, the, um, in the Pale of Settlement. There were uh, a lot of uh, anti-Jewish decrees and pogroms, particularly in the late 1800s. And uh, that forced a lot of Jews out and a couple of million of them got to the United States. That was a good thing too. We're, we're glad they got here before all the bad stuff started. Okay, now Vilna uh, was a place that Napoleon stopped by uh, on his way to Russia and his, his crushing defeat of his grand army, 680,000 guys on the way in, something like 20,000 guys made it back. Um, he supposedly marveled at the place. It, it's, it's amazing to, to read about the way that they used to conduct military campaigns in those good days. They would, they would come into a city, they'd hang around, they'd have parties, balls, be uh, guests of the locals and so forth, while the, the ordinary soldiers had to go out and forage for food, but, but the officers and the, uh, the elites would hang around in the city and, and have a lot of fun. And he was, Napoleon supposedly was very impressed by the Jewishness of the place. He was, um, it, it's been said that he said this is the Jerusalem of Europe. Whether he did or not, uh, I'm not sure, but the, um, the Jews who lived there <coughs> thought it was anyway. They were very proud of their community. They were kind of like Boston sports fans with their, um, you know, their, their pride in their Jewishness. If you wanted to be a rabbi, you went and studied there. You'd study there and then they would go back to the shtetls and, and, and do their rabbinical work, but um, it, it all started there. Now, the Grand Army, this was the site of the Grand Army's defeat, and it was, it was a foreshadowing of some horrible things that we'll be talking about in a little while. Um, the last real battle they had uh, when they were retreating, the army, French army was retreating in, in disarray. A lot, they'd thrown away a lot of their weapons, and they were taking wagons full of booty that they had gotten from, uh, from Russia. They had already lost a lot of people on the way back. And, um, on the coming out of Vilna, um, Napoleon, by the way, bypassed Vilna. He, he left in disguise in a carriage uh, a couple of weeks before and never actually gave the order to re retreat to his troops. And so a lot of them were still around Vilna. And uh, one, one night, 40,000 guys were killed on uh, Panerai Hill, which is seven miles west of the city. That was the, the final crushing defeat uh, of the, the Grand Army of Napoleon. And that was the first great killing uh, at, at Panerai Hill. Okay, and then the end of the Napoleonic Wars, then Russia uh, came in and they, 
they sent a bunch of governors. They were, most of them were brutal. They didn't get along. They, they didn't like the people. The people didn't like them. So Russia ruled the place, but it was not a, not a happy marriage at all. Okay. I mentioned it was the uh, center of Talmudic learning. Uh, also, there, was, there were um, a lot of artists there. Uh, Marc Chagall was from there or uh, spent some time there. It was the center of the printing industry. The, the Vilna Talmud uh, was printed there. And uh, we'll talk about the book smugglers um, fighting the Nazi hol Holocaust, the cultural Holocaust, a little later. That was uh, Herman Crook's operation. So it was four. This is a kind of a quick and dirty history of, uh, of Vilna. There were four different nations ruling Vilna within uh, that time of period of September 39 to June 41. And then they, uh, they had the ghetto for about two years. And uh, of about 57,000 57, Jews who were the pre-war um, population, uh, only a couple thousand survived. And um, th the Great Synagogue, we have a picture of the Great Synagogue coming up. Uh, it was left to the, the Russians to, to bulldoze that when they, um, under, uh, under Lenin, they had to do away with anything to, to do with any kind of religion or loyalty to any regime other than the, uh, other than the, the communist regime. So they uh, bulldozed the cemetery uh, in 1950 and um, they leveled the great synagogue in 54. It no longer exists and that's, that really is a tragedy. Okay, and 57,000 Jews was the pre-war population. Refugees after the uh, first German invasion swelled the population of the city to about 80,000. Okay, um, so, but after World War I, uh, the, the Russian defeats and the, so the reemergence of Poland as a nation also reinvigorated Polish anti-Semitism. It, it, it had been latent, it was always there, and it, it came back in a number of ways. Um, the, uh, uh, some of the people will uh, be introduced to in my story about Mary's family had specific instances of, uh, of anti-Semitism uh, affecting them and uh, actually a couple of them were able to escape to Israel because they were they had to get out and uh, that, that worked out pretty well for them okay um, and I think just to uh, I think I read this passage before uh, about the uh, how the Russians felt about the Jews but um, when they were um, they were, feel, the Russians were feeling pretty good about themselves, but uh, the mirage of national harmony did not include Jews who were blamed for all the ills of Russia and Poland as well, and the defeat of the Russian army reactivated populist anti-Semitism. All Russians seemed to know a Jew at once by his face and manners and so forth, so the Russians were, uh, were pretty anti-Semitic and prejudiced against the, the uh, Jews as well. Also, Poland um, and Russia were at war after World War I. Um, the uh, initial plans that Lenin had was to spread communism all over the world and the, the resistance from the Poles kind of foiled him locally. Uh, Joseph Pilsudski had the miracle on the Vistula in, in 1920. But um, Poland is, as a country was hard to hang together. There were a lot of different ethnic groups mixed in there. They all didn't really get along. Also, it was, as James Michener mentions in his novel, Poland, it's like a soccer field. It's such an easy place for marauding armies to just sweep in and, and wreak havoc. They had no mountains to protect them, very few rivers and so forth. Okay. So fast forward to 1939. Germany had always already begun uh, oppressing Jews. And uh, this is the, what they planned under the molotov ribbentrop Pact. We were going to have it this way. In fact, it, it ended up being uh, like this for a little while. Russians gave Lithuanians, or pretended to give Lithuanians a little bit of sway uh, over their country for a while until they again moved in and, and, uh, and betrayed them. So, uh, but when they came in, they let the Lithuanians rule for eight months um, after World War I started. And then uh, anti-Jewish riots broke out among the Lithuanians almost immediately. Uh, when the Russians came in, they nationalized all the businesses, 370 of them. 265 of them belonged to Jews. 
They deported a lot of the leaders of society out to their gulag, 30,000 people of whom 6,000 were Jews. So they, they hollowed out a lot of the local society in, in Poland and Lithuania, making it even easier when the Germans came in. The, the local populace had been stripped of many of its leading citizens uh, by the time the Germans came in. Okay, so war breaks out in, um, in September 39. Uh, there, there were, these were the four places that ruled Vilna in succession. First was part of Poland, then Lithuania, and then Russia versus Germany. Um, and then the um, Russians, when the Russians, after the Russians kicked out the Lithuanians on some, uh, some pretext of uh, not following orders or, or not being loyal, um, they, uh, they took the, over the country and they began building a fuel dump at this place called Ponari. And I want to, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about that because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a place that I had actually never heard of. And I, I like to think that I was you know, fairly well up on, on my history. I've heard of, I had heard of uh, Babi Yar, uh, I've heard of the, the uh, Katyn Forest and other places of massacre. I, I never knew about Ponari until I got to know Mary. But this was a, uh, a killing field just to the west of Lithuania. This is p where Panarai Hill was, where Napoleon's 40,000 guys uh, were killed in that last great defeat of the Grand Army. And here, the Russians decided that they were going to build up their military capacity in that uh, part of Europe. They went out to Ponari, which had been a recreation area. This is the city of Vilna here. This is the road that many, many people took to their deaths. This is Ponari right here, a railroad station. This is, this is a hilly area. And it was um, a vacation and recreational area. This photograph is from 1939. That's a gymnasium for, uh, from Vilna. A, a bunch of girls from uh, school, they're out there on holiday in 1939, right before this all started. It was a, a pretty pleasant place that uh, you know, people would go to for recreation. There's hills and sand pits and um, a lot of other places where you can go and just get outdoors and have a good time. Um, this is Lukiski. I know I'm not saying that right. That's the Lukiski or Luziski prison uh, in Vilna. This was the first place most people who were taken uh, from the ghettos or off the streets went initially. They were held in the prison for a little while until they were ready to be shipped out to Ponari to die. Um, sometimes they were taken off the streets and went directly, but usually they ended up going through there. This is the guard barracks at the entrance to Ponari. And here is what it actually looked like. This is one of the pits where they were going to build a fuel tank. There were five or six of such pits. Uh, they never got completed. Here. These are Jews here who are about to be killed. These are Lithuanian guards. And you can see here the, the uh, uh, wooden scaffolding or, or the wooden framing that they would have built the tank walls with. But uh, they never got to finish them because the Germans invaded and the Russians had to beat it back out. And, and here are some, some people just uh, lined up waiting to die. Uh, but I have a close-up a close of that. There's 10 guys in a row. They will be shot and they will fall into the pit and more will be shot after them. Uh, these are Lithuanian guards here, people walking one by one to their death. And this is, this is a whole line of people just waiting to be executed. That's a close-up of, uh, the, of the people who are going to die. These, they, have all, they all have cloths over their heads. Um, they're, these guys aren't stripped naked. A lot of people were, um, especially after the first defeats of the, uh, the German army when they needed clothing. Um, they would strip people naked and take their clothing back, among other things. This, this is one of the 150 Lithuanians who did all the executing. They were, they were called shawlists by, the peop by the, uh, a man who wrote a, uh, uh, a book called Ponari Diary, which I have here. Um, these are, are people who are going to be shot they, they, this was the, uh, the commando um, that was put together in 1943 to exhume bodies and burn them. And they were, they were going to end up getting killed anyway. And these are three of the bodies that you see covered up with sand. They would shoot people, they'd cover them up with a light layer of sand, and then do it again. 
So it's a horrible, horrible place. Um, it, 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 its name should live in infamy with, with Bobby Yar, uh, where um, was it 31,000 people died? It was in just a course of two days, I think. It was a, a massacre of everybody. They were marched out of Kiev, everybody they could find in Kiev. They, they killed them at the ravine at Bobby Yar. But in, at Ponari, there were probably 75,000 people killed, maybe even more than that. Most of them were Jews. Some of them were, were uh, Polish resistors or captured uh, Russian army guys, but the vast majority of them were Jews. So, okay, and then, oops, that, that last one is the, uh, this shows how, how far, how far the, uh, the Germans got uh, with their, their advance. They, they got pretty far into Russia. Um, and they, they, here's Lithuania, Latvia, here they moved well beyond that. And as soon as the uh, military would conquer an area, the Einsatz group would come in, round up Jews, and usually shoot them. That was the modus operandi they had. Uh, but the Germans made the same mistake that Napoleon made. You just don't invade Russia. It's too big. The land will end up overwhelming you. And that's, that's exactly what happened. And the Germans um, were quite foolish in their equipping of their army. They didn't send their guys in with winter gear but or you know, heavy boots or anything like that. They didn't think they were going to be there that long. They got bogged down. Many of them froze to death. And um, later on when um, the, um, they decided they needed people to uh, help in, in the, the back lines, making shoes, making clothing, repairing vehicles. That spared a lot of the Jews from immediate execution. Some of them were able to survive. Okay, so Germany invades in 1941. Uh, so are you going to flee or are, are you not going to flee? There were 60,000 Jews, 60,000 Lithuanians, and 10,000 Poles and others uh, in Vilna. That, those are rough round numbers. Do you flee? Or do you not flee? Most people stayed. The um, Jewish folks, um, at least according to Mary, and I think this, was a, this is a pretty universal thought, they had been discriminated against before. You know, the czars were bad to us. We'll, we'll just hunker down. We'll get through it. And they, there was also an idea floated in some quarters that Germans really are a, a cultured people, and we're cultured. I mean, they. Maybe they'll oppress us, but they, they won't do anything really bad to us. And nobody could imagine that they had in mind a wholesale massacre. And that maybe by that time the Germans hadn't fully decided upon it yet. But the, the uh, people who were in Vilna, Mary's family, they didn't think it was going to be uh, either all that bad or something that they couldn't survive. Well, we'll just get through it. That's what they, many, many people thought. So the... Uh, the Einsatz group number nine moves in, and they they did a lot of the usual stuff that we've heard about to uh, to control the populace. They made them wear the stars. Um, they they uh, would harass them with uh, all sorts of petty regulations. Jews couldn't go out uh, from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. They were allowed to shop only from 10 a.m. to noon. Uh, they couldn't use phones. Then uh, a little while after that, they were not allowed to walk on the sidewalks. They had to walk in the streets. And then the Germans decided you couldn't walk in the main street. If your house was on a main street, you could only go as far as the next block and go down a side street. Um, they were, uh, the, the harassment and keeping people off balance was one of the, the tactics that they used. Okay, there were 150 Lithuanians also who were members of the police force. Um, one of the things that they used to do was go around and just snatch people, snatch people off the street, particularly young men. Um, they would tell them that they were going to work, or sometimes they would have roundups in the neighborhoods and, and say, you're coming out to a work camp, get a, a piece of soap and a towel, that's all you're going to need. They would disappear, they would go to Ponari, would never be seen again. Um, and that was, uh, that worked for a long time, the deception, worked for a long time, um, it, it, at least several months. People thought that their husbands and sons were going to be coming back. They didn't come back, but um, the, the Germans did keep them in the dark. Uh, they had a, um, 
the, the first Judenrat, the, the Jewish council, was led by a man named Dr. Wygodsky, who was a different, distant relative of, of Mort, uh, who, who ended up marrying Mary some years later. He was the first leader of the Judenrat. He was a very well-respected guy. He was the leader of the community during the First World War and was the man with whom the conquering Germans would deal. And they were different kinds of conquering Germans then. They were only interested in military conquest. They were not um, doing what Hitler was doing. But uh, Dr. Wygodsky, until they ended up killing him uh, sh uh, shortly after that. But he was the, member, the first member of the, the Judenrat. Uh, they began to issue work permits. Um, if they, they did need people to work in the, in the various companies and in, in industries in and around Vilna, even before the, the big wave of, uh, of defeats ramped up the need uh, for, for working on more defense-related industries. But they would allow the, the Judenrat to um, distribute work permits, but many fewer than there were uh, in the local population. So if you had a work permit, you were a legal Jew. And if you didn't, you were an illegal Jew. If you had a work permit, chances are they would not take you right to Ponari, but if you didn't have one and they, they found you, you would be whisked off. And that would be, uh, so that would be, this was another way they would subtly uh, divide the Jews of the community into the haves and the have-nots. Are you, are you legal, are you not legal? And the, the ones who were illegal had to hide in places called malinas, uh, they were pretty imaginative as to how they, they could hide uh, in their houses. A lot of them were able to survive, you know, a year or two by hiding under the floor or in furnaces or in false closets and that sort of thing. Uh, but that was, that was life uh, early on in Vilna, where um, in, um, let's see, there were up to, up to 500 people a day were, were seized uh, off the streets in those, uh, those early months of 1941. And in July of 1941, there were thousands of people who, who disappeared, um, including some of Mary's relatives. And a, a black market quickly developed in the, um, uh, with, uh, in the goods that they had brought with them. Uh, occasionally, they were told they were going to be uh, sent to another camp. So you know, bring, bring some possessions, whatever you can carry. People would take good stuff. They would take their best clothes. They would hide money in the, in the clothing. And a black market developed uh, where the, the Germans and the Lithuanians would take the best stuff for themselves. Um, they would either give the rest to peasants or, or uh, distribute it back into the, uh, into the community. And there was one time where um, uh, one of Mary's relatives uh, had been swept up in, in one of the early actions, as they called them. Um, and I, uh, a couple of days later, a guy came into the uh, business where um, uh, Mary's father still had. He was in the leather business. And he said, I've got, I've got this coat here, and it says, uh, it says Tabahovich. Um, what's, um, what's the story? Is this, uh, is this a member of your family? And it turns out it was his brother. The, his coat had been taken from him after he had been killed at Ponari, and a, uh, a gentleman who bought it on the black market, or was given it on the black market, noticed it, knew, knew Mr. Tabahovich, and, and went to, um, to his place and asked him. So, now, um, the work got very much bigger and very much dirtier very quickly. The, um, there was a, an incident called the Great Provocation, where they, they got 3,700 Jews were executed eventually. Uh, it was a setup by Lithuanians. It was August 31 of 1941. Uh, two Lithuanians went into a Jewish house. They fired a gun out at a German soldier, and they came running out and said, Jew shot you, Jew shot you. They dragged out two Jews and killed them on the spot. And then. The order went out, everybody has to stay inside unless you had permits. And then they, uh, uh, as a punishment, they, they um, pulled out the occupants of seven streets uh, in the Jewish neighborhood, sent them all to Panari and killed them. And that was when they disbanded the Judenrat, the Judenrat under Dr. Wygodsky. They, Wygodsky. they killed them because they no longer needed them. This was a punishment for what these perfidious Jews did, shooting at our German soldiers. 
people still thought, many people still thought that that was true, that that was just a, a one-time thing. It was retribution for this crime, whether it was real or alleged. They, they still didn't quite get it. They still didn't believe. Okay? Now, then, then they set up two ghettos in the neighborhood that emptied, was emptied from the provocation. This was, they operated a little differently in Vilna, where they, uh, in, in many other cities, the Jewish neighborhood became the ghetto. They just crammed everybody into that. Um, not quite the same way here. There were seven empty streets that um, w w from the 3,700 Jews who were taken away uh, after the Great Provocation. That became the ghetto. They, uh, and they divided it up into two ghettos. There was the small ghetto, ghetto number two, and the large ghetto. Um, they had a Judenrat in both of them. And they, the, these two bodies were competing. The small ghetto didn't last very long because the scheme was to get old people, sick people, and those who couldn't work uh, into uh, ghetto number two or the small one and ultimately to uh, execute them. And the, the people in the larger ghetto would be, at least a large minority of them, would be pass holders and people who were capable of working. Um, and the, uh, let's see, the Jewish police force uh, was set up uh, to, to do the organizing and the selecting. The, the Jewish police, again, another way of setting Jew against Jew. Some of the, the police were not that bad and they were doing it because they had to do it. Some of them more or less embraced what they had to do and were almost loyal Nazis. But they, they ended up being um, hated by most of the population by the, by the end of things because, uh, among other things, they, they were quite corrupt. They would be the, the guards of the uh, gates of the ghetto, morning and evening. Somebody tried to sneak something in, they would take it for themselves. Uh, sometimes if you, if you tried to sneak food in and a, a Gestapo or an SS guy happened to be there, you could be shot on the spot because, the, uh, again, to uh, keep the population subdued, of course they wanted to keep their food rations very low and to try to starve them, so it became a, a capital crime to sneak stuff in. Sometimes the Jewish police who were the good guys would pretend to be searching people and allow them in, but other times they wouldn't. But in any case, it was another way of setting a different segments of the population against one another. Here's the ghetto, uh, here's the gate of the, um, on what street is that? I don't know, there were a couple of different gates of the, uh, of ghetto number one. I don't think this is Nymeka Street, I think it's the other one. And uh, a further a scheme they had was that the uh, ghetto gates would be on opposite sides of the ghetto, so you couldn't come out one gate and, and go in another one. If you wanted to go from ghetto to ghetto, you'd have to go all the way around. And some people managed to do it, but uh, they made it very, very difficult on people. Okay, uh, let's see. We talked about the, um, the great provocation. Then came actions, A-K-T-I-O-N, which were raids. Basically, they had a couple of big raids to, uh, to drag people out and, um, and, and get ultimately get them to Ponari. There were three of them in October of 1941. Uh, after a Yom Kippur action in, uh, of 1941, the, um, where the cops and Lithuanians broke into the synagogues where, of course, every, everybody was there, or most of the devout, uh, devout Jews were there uh, for Yom Kippur. They were easy prey, easy, easy pickings to be, to be taken. The 2,000 people were taken away to Ponari, and even if they had work pits, permits, they were taken anyway. And people then began to realize that the work permits were, were kind of a sham. But then there were um, three other passes, uh, three other actions in October where they would, they would go into a, a particular street and, um, and drag people out of their houses, check their passes, check their credentials, and if they didn't have any, they would take them to Ponari. And these are the numbers from, uh, of the victims in October. Uh, then they decided they were going to issue these yellow work passes <coughs> in uh, October of 1941. And they were, um, if, you're, if you had a work pass to do essential work, um, they would allow, I don't know why they did it, but they would allow the holder of the pass to designate three members of his family who would also be covered by the pass. Um, 
Was there a particular German who led all the activities in uh, this area? Um, they had, um, uh, was the guy named uh, Bruno Keitel was, the, was in charge of, of uh, Vilna for a lot of the, um, of the time. K-E-I-T-E-L. He was, um, he, he sat at the, at the head. There might have been one or two other people who were the, the, the commandant of, of Vilna uh, during that time as well, but the German soldiers didn't do an awful lot. The SS was operating, but the, the bulk of the dirty work was done by Lithuanians. Uh, there were some SS who would go in and, and conduct the raids, but the um, uh, Lithuanians, 150 of them, did all the shooting at Ponari with one German guy to uh, oversee them. Um, Lithuanians enthusiastically embraced the German cause. They decided they would bet on that horse, basically, after when the war started. Um, the, the Russians had, had kicked them out, um, and after letting them rule the country for a while, they had kicked them out, so they didn't like the Russians either, so they, their loyalty to the Germans was intensified by that. And it stayed that way for a while until the, um, the war began uh, turning against um, the Germans and they needed more guys out on the front. They decided to organize a Lithuanian brigade uh, and then all of a sudden hundreds of Lithuanians disappeared into the forest. So they didn't want to go fight. You know, they'd kill Jews for the Germans, but they didn't want to go fight for them. So anyway, they were. Um, it's downright depressing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like what? It's all depressing. Yeah, it, it's. Can you imagine living there? No. No. Well, uh, some, I know some people who lived through it, and I, I don't know how they did it. Um, my friend Mary um, became. She became a member of one of those faux families uh, because one of the. Um, uh, one of her relatives named Kovner, K-O-V-N-E-R, got a permit uh, and his, um, his family had been dragged off to Ponari in one of the early raids. So she, for the duration of the war, uh, of the time in Vilna anyway, became Mila Kovner. That was her name. She had to tell everybody her name was Mila Kovner. And she was, was able to, uh, to survive up until the time they, they liquidated the ghetto. Um, and then they had to... Um, they would have the passes would expire, and then they'd have to have them uh, you know, reinstituted the, uh, by the uh, Jewish, uh, uh, the, a reconvened Judenrat or the Jewish police. They would issue fewer, or they, they'd issue different color ones, all to confuse the population, you know, keep them off balance, keep them pitted against one another. Now we come to, well, in December 1941, there were no big uh, actions anymore. That was when the Russians began their winter counteroffensive. Um, guys from uh, the front, German guys from the front, were coming back, frozen, wounded, in very bad shape. Uh, this this diary mentions, I think it was even in November of 1941. Great news from the front: freezing soldiers are coming back. You know they're uh, they're already starting to lose it. Um, but the um, the battle then, the bureaucratic battle between the, the Wehrmacht, the, the German armed forces, and the German civilian administration, and the SS that was charged only with killing Jews, getting rid of all the Jews. Um, temporarily, the, the needs of the Wehrmacht and the, uh, the German war machine won out. They needed more labor, so they stopped the killings en masse. Killings still went on but at a much uh, lower pace. And life actually in the Vilna ghetto almost became normal for a year or so. Um, people would, would, uh, who had work permits would go out to work. People who didn't, they, would, they were still hiding. Uh, and they would uh, somehow have food smuggled into them. And uh, they, they, life did go on. And it was, it was almost like a calm uh, within the storm. And this is the guy who was in charge of it. His name was Jacob Jens. He's a, a Jewish Lithuanian who was first the, the chief of the Jewish police and ultimately the, um, the dictator of the ghetto. He was the, the guy who was solely in charge of the ghetto. Um, history is of two minds about Jacob Jens. Some people think he was a, a traitor and a, uh, 
in bed with the Nazis. Others think he did the, the best under the circumstances, um, giving up some people who were going to die anyway, trying to bargain down the numbers to be turned over to the SS. The, you could argue both sides of it, but he was the guy who was in charge um, uh, of, the, of the ghetto. His mantra was work to live by the um, late in 1943. Just about everybody who was remaining in the first ghetto, they liquidated the second ghetto, the smaller ghetto, that only lasted a couple of months. Everybody who was remaining in the, in the ghetto was either working or hiding. They were productive, and you know, we can show that we're, we're productive to the Nazis, maybe they won't kill us. That was what he was, was telling the population. He did know what the Germans were about, or people believed, or came to believe that he did know what the Germans were all about, and he never did tell them there was one instance where a woman uh, made it out of Ponari. She was only wounded. She waited until nightfall. She and, and one or two of her friends climbed out of the pit without any clothing on. They wandered through the forest. They happened upon a, uh, a peasant's house where the peasant um, you know, took pity on them, gave them some food, gave them some clothing, and cleaned them up. And they ended up going back into the city. And they, uh, Mary actually said she saw uh, a woman like this, this woman, I don't know if it was this first one, it happened a couple of times, but she said she saw someone uh, running through the streets saying, they're killing us, they're killing us, I've seen it. The, the first woman was uh, brought back to, the, um, uh, to Jacob Jens and his, his buddies. They put her in the hospital and told her not to say anything and didn't tell anybody about it. They, they knew what was going on. They, said that she was mentally deranged and they, uh, they put her away so nobody would hear the story. So they, they probably did know what was going on, uh, but they chose not to, to tell the populace either to not to alarm them or so as not to, to foment a rebellion. So that's, his tactic was to keep a lid on things. And he served his purpose, but the Nazis ended up killing him on some pretext uh, in 1943. So he, it didn't work for him personally. But this is the guy who was in charge of the ghetto uh, for a while. And all of the Jewish police were appointed by him, and uh, they were his buddies. There was resistance. Resistance did start in the ghetto. Um, Abba Kovner is uh, Mary's cousin. Fascinating guy. I'll talk a lot more about him in other contexts. Um, but Vilna, they, they did realize, at least Kovner, and this uh, Wittenberg, who was a communist, who was with a rival youth organization, um, they got it. Uh, Kovner uh, and his friends, as a bunch of his friends, were hidden in a Carmelite convent um, at some distance from the city for a while. They stayed there, uh, shielded by the, a nun named Ma Mother Bertranda, who was one of the heroes of the Holocaust. In fact, the last none from that community just died about six months ago. She, she lived until like 102. Um, but they, uh, they did shield Abba and his, his friends out there for a while. And it was on New Year's Eve of 1941 where he, he wrote this, this manifesto, we will not go as sheep to the slaughter, we will mount an armed resistance. Uh, they did uh, resist a little bit later on. Uh, they, they smuggled guns and explosives into the city. Uh, they, their plan was to have a Warsaw type uprising, even though they hadn't heard of Warsaw yet. They were going to do something similar. It never did come off. Um, in fact, they did have, they did send couriers. They were able to, to slip couriers out of the cities to, to go to places like the Warsaw Ghetto. I don't know how they did it. Uh, the best ones were, were young girls because they were uh, less obtrusive. In fact, Abba asked Mary to join him one time, and I'm sure he had that in mind for her. And, and she declined to, to take him up on that offer. Um, that's probably why she's alive today. But um, Warsaw Jews, when they heard about this, uh, what was happening in Vilna, said, uh, you know, not my problem. We, we have our own problems here. We can't give you any guns or ammunition. They, they did end up getting some from the, not too many from the Polish resistance. Uh, Abba also um, got some help from Mother Bertranda who knew what was going on and wanted to help. And she actually, after Abba came back into the ghetto, she came there one day and said, I, I want to join you. I think this is, 
this is where the goodness lies. She had gone to the Catholic uh, authorities in Vilna and told them what was happening, and they, they blew her off, whoever the bishop was there. Or the, the head churchman uh, did not give her a sympathetic ear. So she came to the ghetto, and Abba said, look, and I, you won't do any good here, but we really need weapons. We need explosives. Can you do anything like that? So Mother Bertranda came back and forth visiting a few times and stuck guns and grenades in and um, smuggled them into to Abba and his buddies. So she was, she was pretty brave. And um, we'll, we'll meet her a little bit more later. Okay, they did, um, they did get, um, they were able to blow up a, uh, a bridge, um, sneak out of the ghetto and blow up a bridge that a military train was coming in on. And the Germans thought it was the Polish partisans. They had no idea that the Jews from Vilna had done it. Um, this guy ended up getting ratted out and was arrested. Uh, he was going to, going to be shot uh, right near the end of, uh, right near the end of the time of the ghetto. And um, he ended up committing suicide. He was given a cyanide pill by Jacob Jens. So, you know, Jens knew it was going to happen. And he gave him the, uh, the cyanide pill. He also, Jens also knew, kind of knew what Kovner and his buddies were up to. And he kept an eye on them, but he didn't clamp down on them either. So. Now, was he was he supportive or not? We don't really know. We don't really know. Um, but after the uh, things quieted down, as I say, life almost became normal. They had um, their one of the big problems was getting uh, food distributed. Actually, one of the, the ways that they were able to move food around and and help the people who really needed it was uh, through the chimney sweeps. Uh, because they were doing their work up on the roofs. The, uh, those neighborhoods are all very close together. They could hop in and out of the ghettos. They could, they could go about undetected. They were um, very important operators in, in, in keeping people alive. Uh, they had uh, clinics set up just about anywhere there was, a, there was a bed. So many people were sick. And they were actually able to, um, to keep the populace you know, fairly healthy. You know, uh, given the, um, the sanitary conditions and given all the, uh, um, the, the starvation or near starvation that they were going through, they were still relatively healthy. Um, and let's see, they, uh, they uh, newborn babies, one of the laws that they, the, the Germans passed was you, can, you can't have any kids. So there were some newborn babies who came along anyway and they were able to backdate their documents saying that they were born before the law was passed and they, they saved a lot of, um, of kids that way. They had uh, an orchestra, they set up uh, schools, Mary went to school, uh, even in the ghetto. They had a, a pretty thriving library system, uh, mostly run by, by Herman Crook. There was a big lending library where people would go even after a, a long day of work or of you know, uh, torturous existence and they would read. So they, they kept up their, their uh, cultural life despite it all. So it was very tough there. But they, um, they were resilient. And up, to, up until 1943, when things began to change again, um, life was, if not normal, at least bearable for people like Mary. OK, so um, there were. There was need to send a work party to Estonia, and this was nobody. By this time, nobody believed what Jacob Jens was saying, and if they were told they were going to a, to be in a work party, people thought, "No, we're you know we're going to be be slaughtered or something." Uh, so they didn't tend to believe them. But uh, there were they had to send 2,000 uh, uh, Jews to Estonia, and either they they had to go or they had to hide. Uh, they they came searching through homes. Um, they were. Um, they ended up even blowing up a couple of streets, uh, including the uh, the house where Mary lived. That was blown up at this time, and um, all but a few of them were uh, were de deported to Estonia or to Riga, Latvia, um, and the rest of them were killed. The um, 300 Jews after the, the ghetto was liquidated. We're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves here, but there were 300 Jews sent to a facility called HKP which was a uh, place that made clothing and they also uh, repaired military vehicles. And that was a, a great job to have because it was under 
the auspices of a German guy named Major Plaga, who was a good guy and he, he fed his people well and, and shielded them from the SS. FBO? Oh, that, that's the, um, the youth organization, oh. the, the youth resistance organization. Okay. Uh, it was on September 14th uh, of uh, 43, Jacob Jens was summoned and, uh, and shot. And then um, for, he had served his purposes and his, his purpose and they, they knew they were going to end up liquidating the ghetto anyway. On September 24th of uh, 43, uh, all the women and children who were remaining in the city, this included our friend Mary, were lined up in a monastery yard. Um, the, between 1,400 and 1,700 of the, the younger, healthier ones who were deemed fit to work were sent to Riga, Latvia. Um, and then the rest of them were sent either to Majdanek or Ponari and ended up getting killed. So Mary was separated from her, her mother and her, her young siblings then. Her father and brother had gone, uh, had gone to Kluga where they ended up dying. But Mary was, was taken from the monastery and sent to Riga, Latvia. Okay, then near the end, um, there was a, an, uh, an old people's action where all of the elderly people who were still remaining were taken. And that, that was significant because this time, the, all, the entire selection was made by Jews. Jews decided which Jews are going to die. That was the old people's action. And then right before um, the ghetto was liquidated, the uh, resistance organization escapes into the forest. And uh, Abba Kovner was, uh, was the leader of that that resistance organization. After uh, that uh, gentleman Wittenberg uh, was killed uh, by the cyanide, Abba, who was the second in command, took over the, the FPO. And they decided they, they had to get out. They did not, even though they had weapons to, to mount armed resistance, they decided not to do it. Uh, they decided to flee to the forest and become partisans. And th that's where they, they lived out the rest of the war, uh, trying to uh, wreak mayhem on uh, you know, German troop movements or, or German transportation. They had some success at it too. Not a great <coughs> deal of it, but they, uh, they, did, they did pretty good work out there with what they had to work with. The uh, order from, from Himmler to, there was not a, a, an order to kill them all, but all Jews in the, uh, in the West to be uh, enclosed in the concentration camps. Jews into the concentration camps. That was his, his order. Um, so that's it, what, it, what it really meant was send them all out east and get them killed, but, but it, they didn't say kill them. But they, by this time they had those killing camps set up, you know, uh, Sobibor, Majdanek, Treblinka, uh, Belzec, uh, out in the, uh, in the area which is now Belarus. That's in where they were set up just for killing. But this was the order on June 21, 1943. Okay, um, and then in, in Riga, this is where Mary ended up going to Riga to make clothing and war goods. And um, this was the euphemism that uh, they, they talked about, evacuate them to the east. Non-essential inhabitants, those who are not going to be doing any work for us anymore, uh, will get evacuated to the east. Um, there was, I would mentioned the HKP, uh, where about 300 people were still remaining. One of them was a, um, uh, a gentleman I, I met in Boston, um, a real estate um, landlord, a very uh, prosperous gentleman now named Sid Handler, uh, was there. He survived uh, an action, that, uh, the children's action that killed almost all of the kids who were remaining. In the HKP facility, there were a lot of women there, and his mother happened to be working as a seamstress. For a while, they, they let the family stay there. But they decided, the Nazis decided that we were going to kill all the kids. So they, um, they had a, an announcement that they were going to go someplace. It was some kind of fake announcement, maybe for some activity or field trip. But um, Mr. Handler's mother knew what, was, all, what it was, was going to happen, and she looked for a way out. Uh, they were marching out of their living quarters through a corridor uh, the morning of the children's action. And she noticed a door, so she just shoved Sid in and said, stay there until I come for you. It turns out it was a uh, lumber storage bin, and nobody bothered checking there. Sid stayed there all day up until the night. Mrs. Handler came back, or his mother, her name is 
um, I don't know if her name was Handler at the time, but she came back for him, brought him to the HKP facility, put him underneath a big pile of coats that were being repaired. He stayed there for two months until the Russians came and, and he was liberated. Uh, and he's alive today to tell the story. Um, and he, it, something else that he told me, which was really the exception, uh, they, he said they lived in a pretty nice house uh, on a hill overlooking Vilna. And of course all the Jews were dispossessed of their property. Somebody was living in the house, some Lithuanian guy. He and his mother marched up and she said, this is our house, get the hell out. And the guy did. Ooh. They took the house back. <laughs> and they ended up making it to America. Okay, now, uh, in 1943, a little bit more about Panari. Uh, there was a special uh, unit, Commando 1005, uh, established by Heinrich Himmler. They decided that they needed to hide from the world the evidence of all that, that had happened from, in Ponari. So there were still some Jewish men left in, in Vilna. They recruited 80 Jewish prisoners and sent them uh, to Ponari. And their job was to go down into the pits, dig up all the bodies, and burn them. Um, and after, the, after that happened, of course, they were going to end up getting killed. Um, they removed the bodies. From the, they, had, uh, they worked during the day in, uh, with you know, chains that um, held their legs together. Although, no, the chains were, were put on at night. They were able to, to work uh, without them during the day. And there was actually one instance of a guy who dug up his wife and his children. And he, um, by that time, plans for an escape were underway. And they, this guy almost lost it and, and was going to rush and try to kill some guards, but they, they were able to subdue him and talk him out of it. Um, they knew they were going to die, so they decided they would do something about it. At night, with their hands and with spoons, um, they, they dug a tunnel. They, they had to stay actually in the pits at night and they dug a tunnel and a bunch of them escaped. It was 35 meters long. It was April 15th of 1944. After they had been digging for three months they made their escape. Uh, Fifteen guys went out. Uh, Eleven of them ended up reaching the partisans in the forest. Uh, four of them were shot by guards. The partisans uh, were led by uh, Abba Kovner. He was there to, to welcome them. And it wasn't until very recently that the, um, this tunnel was actually discovered. That there, was, there was sort of knowledge that that had happened, but nobody really knew where the tunnel was. And um, the uh, techniques that are available in the oil industry to probe the strata without drilling you know, have advanced to some degree, and they were able to actually see the silhouette of the actual tunnel. This was within the past 10 years. Um, there is a, um, uh, a an article in the Smithsonian uh, magazine that is on the reading list I gave you. Uh, that tells the entire story of it. Um, a couple of the guys are still alive, or, or were still alive at the time. Okay, so tunnel of 35, uh, 35 meters. So two feet by two feet, with hands and a spoon. Ah. That was a great escape. Okay, but there were about uh, the Commando 10, 1005 burned at least 60,000 corpses in Ponari. They didn't burn them all, but they burned at least 60,000 of them. Okay, and um, in Estonia, they, they, um, Mary went to a camp called Kaiserwald um, that was right outside of Riga. And um, they, they lasted there for a while, then a bunch of them were marched back. Um, she ended up going to a camp called Stutthof and was shipped further back for even more work. Um, death marches at the camps that uh, were closing then became sort of the order of the day. The, the Germans would march people out. Sometimes they'd march them into the forest. They'd, they'd have them march to another camp some distance away. Sometimes they would just shoot them. Uh, there were three death marches from the Stutthof camp westward. Uh, one of them in one of them, Stutthof was on the ocean. They, um, they led uh, a large group of Jews to a cliff overlooking the ocean, shot them and pushed them into the ocean. That was, as the war wound down, that was the kind of thing that, that went on. 
Uh, the Germans were still killing Jews even then, and even while they were trying to cover up some of their tracks uh, by such measures as they took at Ponari. And they also, as I mentioned, burned the, the bodies of the, guy who had, the guys who had been working at Kluge. They just didn't abandon them. They had to kill them and, and burn them. Okay. Um, and then the, the life of, uh, of the partisans, they, they didn't have a lot of food. They didn't have a lot of ammunition. They raided a lot of the local peasants just for those things, just to, to uh, you know, keep themselves in business. But they did stuff like cut phone lines and blow up bridges. Uh, that was pretty good. And the uh, Polish and Russian partisans started fighting each other. They didn't get along. Even though they were fighting against the Nazis, they were also fighting among themselves. And the Russians finally arrived in 44. And this is the final tally. 2,000 to 3,000 Vilna Jews survived from the original population of 57,000. We're a little, oh, we're a little bit, okay, good. Sh shall we take a break? Okay, let's take a five minute break. Okay, I, I think we can recommence. Uh, the, I'd like to just say. Uh, um, probably not. I mean, there were there were a lot of Lithuanian Jews. Like Jens was a Lith dog, Lithuanian Jew. It, it, it was probably for survival. I I, I kind of doubt many of them were Jews. Undoubtedly, there were a few. But I I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I'd like to say a few words about um, s sort of the uh, the Vilna version of the Monuments Men, the Cultural Holocaust. It's a uh, sort of a, a fascinating sideshow here. Um, this is Herman Crook, the guy who wrote this book. That's the librarian. He was the uh, leader of what they called the Paper Brigade. The Nazis didn't want to just destroy all the Jewish people. They wanted to destroy their culture, and they were going to have a museum. Uh, of the vanished Jewish race. They were going to have Juden Forschung ohne Juden, the study of Jews without Jews. In order to do that, they had to get a lot of Jewish artifacts. They didn't know which ones were which. So they, they deputized Herman Crook to work with this guy whose name was Pohl. He's a former Catholic priest uh, who, who convinced Alfred Rosenberg that he was the man for the job in Vilna. And he was the, he supervised uh, Herman Crook. Crook and a, bu a bunch of his cohorts had special passes that gave them the run of the city to go in and out of, of the libraries and the temples and other places where there would be Jewish cultural artifacts. They were able along the way to, they identified a lot of stuff that was shipped off to Berlin. They were able to save some really good stuff, not a lot of it, but some really good things such as the, uh, the record book of the, uh, the Vilna Gaon's synagogue. The Vilna Gaon was the the um, uh, holy man uh, who held court in, in Vilna for, uh, for many years. But there were handwritten records of that synagogue from 1768 to 1924. They saved them. Original works by Sholem Aleichem, a painting by Marc Chagall, the diary of Theodor Herzl, the founder of Zionism. They were able to save that stuff anyway, and it eventually made its way either to New York uh, or to Israel. But the, the book uh, about these these guys is called the book smugglers, and it, it's quite a story. As I say, it's kind of like the Monuments Men. Um, the they weren't able to save a lot of the the say uh, parchments from the Torah scrolls. Many of them found their ways into the soles of boots of German soldiers. The printing plates for the uh, the magnificent Vilna Talmud were melted down and, and sold to the German uh, war machine. But they did collaborate uh, with. Um, Abakovna and the FPO. They gave them access when the, um, when the guards were out at lunch, they gave them access to a library that had Russian military uh, literature in it. The, the uh, Kovna's brother, Michael, and uh, another guy sneaked in there and, and poked around and they found instructions on how to make a bomb. That's how they made the bomb to, uh, to blow up the train. And, um, and some of them were uh, in some of the places where they hid books, uh, Abba and his buddies also held, uh, uh, hid guns. There was one case where they had a machine gun in the library. It was taken apart, but it was sitting out there on a shelf. 
and the Germans come in for an inspection to see all the artifacts and the, the gun is sitting there and they didn't know what to do but, but one of the women who was on the brigade realized what was going on and created a distraction and they were able to, to take the machine gun and, and put it away so the, the Germans didn't see it. And that was a pretty close call. Uh, at the end of the uh, of the war, a few of them, not Herman Crook, uh, he died, but a few of the guys who were on the brigade, the book brigade, including Abba Kovner, came back into Vilna and they put out um, the word to Jewish folks who were around. They look at, we're back, we're collecting Jewish literature, anything that's, that would be relevant that we should save uh, for future generations and put into our own libraries, please let us know. So. Um, they were given a letter that was a plea to our Jewish brothers and sisters. Someone had found this letter by the side of the road. It was dated June 26, 1944, two weeks before the liberation. It was thrown from a truck that was headed to Ponari with 112 people in it. There was one Polish woman who had known where these 112 people were. Uh, she shielded them for a while as long as they could pay her. And after they ran out of money, she ratted them out the Germans came and killed them. So someone who uh, was in that truck wrote this letter, a plea to our Jewish brothers and sisters. They gave the woman's name and address. This is Marisha the widow, and here is what she did to us. So Kovner and his, his friends got a hold of it. They tracked her down. Uh, by the time they tracked her down, uh, she had taken up residence with a, uh, a Russian uh, commander of, of, uh, of some stature, so they couldn't try her and arrest her, so they ambushed her on the street and killed her when they had the chance to. So that was, that was her fate, anyway. Okay, um, let's see, I would like to, well, I have, I have some information about what it was like in post-war Europe. It's a, um, it, it's a little, bit, uh, little bit detailed, and I wanna get into talking about, about Mary because her story is really fascinating, and I'll get through most of it uh, tonight. But uh, some of the, um, the facts that I was going to take was that they uh, talk about there were um, two million displaced people in Germany after the war. There were 2,500 camps uh, of various size, of various sizes. Uh, George Patton, um, who was probably the best thing that ever happened to him, was George C. Scott. Uh, his, uh, his one of the remarks that he made was the Jewish type of displaced person is a subhuman species without any of the cultural or social refinements of our time. Nuremberg trials are a Semitic event, and the American press is under Semitic influence and is seeking to implement communism. This is the great General George Patton. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Tr uh, Harry Truman um, got the word that the the Jews uh, who were in these DP camps were often not being treated very well, and he um, he, he told Eisenhower to, to get with the program and treat them a little better. The U.S. still didn't open up its quota system yet, though, unfortunately. Um, there was a, uh, pogroms continued. This, there was a pogrom in, a pogrom in Kielce, Poland in uh, 1946. This is a particularly uh, sorrowful indication of how bad things were in Poland then. And, you know, th there's been a lot of echoes down through the ages, even today. 42 Jews were murdered at this building in Kielce. Uh, an 80-year-old Polish boy named Henry Blastic had gone missing. He told his father that a Jew kidnapped me and put me in the cellar. Well, there's no cellar in this building, but that didn't matter. Uh, 180 Jews were, were living there at, at that time. Uh, there was a, virtue, a version of the blood libel that, uh, that, that came up. They were um, accused of, of doing all, all sorts of terrible things to this poor little boy who made up the whole story. 80 of the Jews lived there, and there were, let's see, how many of them were killed? Um, well, the, the, the police and military were called in. They, they ended up beating up on the Jews instead of, of uh, uh, doing justice to them. They were stoned. They were beaten with rifles. And their, um, the Polish cardinal, <coughs> Cardinal Holland of Poland, said that that's what you've got to expect. There are too many Jews in government anyway. So at least that's just a, this is another thing that... Another one of those churchmen that I'm not proud of. This guy here, uh, Otto Ohlendorf, was a, an Einsatzgruppe commander in uh, Ukraine. For some reason, Pope Pius 
pleaded for clemency for this guy, even though he was responsible for the murder of thousands and thousands of Jews. I don't know why. Uh, there were many um, what they call rat lines uh, run by the Red Cross and the Vatican Relief Commission that got a lot of the bad guys out to, to South America, including the uh, national, funded by the National Catholic Welfare Committee, which is led by Cardinal Spellman of New York. Uh, the rat lines, uh, the safe government of um, uh, rat lines through Germany to Italy, Spain, and Argentina, ultimately a bunch of safe houses where the people could be secreted on their way to Argentina. The uh, head organizer of that was um, Cardinal Giovanni Montini, who ended up being Pope Paul VI. Um, and then the Pontifical College under Father Kunislaw Dragunovic ran a rat, lights, a rat line for Croats of the Eustatia, uh, laundered with, uh, or funded with money through the Vatican Bank. Klaus Barbie, the butcher of Lyon, escaped as a result of that. So that, um, again, m more unfortunate stories of the Catholic Church helping the bad guys escape, uh, somewhat under the excuse that they would help us fight communism, but I don't know if you believe that. I, I certainly don't. Okay, here's Mary. This is Mary Tabahovich, Mara Tabahovich. That's me with her, that's uh, actually three years ago now, down at the, um, in the backyard of her house in St. Petersburg. Uh, she was the oldest of five kids. And she survived three camps, Kaiserwald, Stutthof, and Magdeburg. She was in there for these dates. And then uh, she ended up coming to uh, Israel where she met her husband and then went on to America. Um, they, they lived in a, uh, they were a pretty prosperous family. They were not super rich. Her father owned a leather business. Uh, she had said that he wasn't really a very good merchant. Um, he wasn't a good businessman. In fact, sometimes his mother had to go and watch the, uh, watch the store while he was off at a, at a ball game or at some cultural event. Uh, she used to cover up for him when he smoked, even though he wasn't supposed to smoke. Or, or take a piece of uh, verboten meat. They were in a little bit of league like that. There was one time, uh, while they were pretty well off and they had a very large apartment, they had live-in help, they weren't always uh, making out very well in business. Uh, there was one time there he said that their furniture was repossessed because they had bought the furniture in credit, on credit, and uh, Mr. Tabahovich's um, customers weren't paying him and he couldn't understand why. Uh, he, he wasn't really a great businessman. He was, he was just a good guy. He was also very musical. Um, Mary told me that one regret that she had was that she never learned how to play the piano, even though she was given many lessons and there were musical instruments all throughout their house. Um, she didn't take to it early and the, the, the teacher had said she wasn't quite ready for it. She never went back to it and she, she did regret it. Um, but they were, um, it was a pretty happy time. Uh, for them, they um, they did have live-in help. Um, she told one time she she mentioned that they were um, the uh, live-in helper had taken them around to a, a different part of the city uh, near what they called the Ostra Brahma, which was a, a gate next to the biggest Catholic church in the city. And the the uh, helper who was not Jewish um, noticed that there was a Catholic festival going on. People were kneeling in the streets. She knelt down and the kids knelt down and mother had to tell them, no, we, we, we don't do that. You know, uh, Jewish folks don't kneel down like the Catholics do, like the Christians. Um, Mary was, uh, her best friend uh, was named Bella. Um, I've met Bella also, she lives in New York. She's a lady who doesn't like to talk about what she went through, although we had a couple of very nice meetings and I, I did get a little bit of good information out of her. I have a short chapter on her for the book. But they were, they were the best of buddies in what would be the equivalent of grammar school. Uh, while the, um, after the um, ghettos were, the ghetto was liquidated and they shipped a bunch of people off to Riga, Mary and Bella and, and another friend named Dora were all thrown together in the same rail car. They stayed together for the entire time and they, they, they became each other's, one another's family. Uh, they survived together and were able to, uh, to support each other. And that's, um, Bella is still alive today, Dora is deceased, but that's, that was the family that Mary was deprived of. In many ways that was uh, while she was going through the, the hell of the camps. Uh, Mary had many 
many times the um, uh, the coin was flipped for her and it came up heads. It was, it's amazing how many times she escaped death. Um, let's see. Here, well, here very quickly are the camps. This is Kaiserwald here, Stutthof, and uh, uh, Buchenwald is over here. Um, when you, you don't see the um, uh, Magdeburg, which is a, su a sub camp of Buchenwald, but those were the three places she was at. Um, she was sent first uh, to the Kaiserwald after they were separated uh, in the churchyard after the order to liquidate the ghetto. She was torn away from her, uh, her family, wanted to go with her mother. She was hit with a rifle butt and got knocked out. Uh, she ended up uh, being thrown into the corner of the rail car. Dora and Bella either landed on her or she landed on them, but they were all together. They went to the, uh, in the rail car to Kaiserwald and um, uh, that's where the first of, actually the second of her, her uh, flippings where the, the coin came up heads. There was another time uh, in the ghetto where she went out without her star and was caught by the cops and brought to the station. And she was very scared and didn't know what to say. She was fortunate in that she had blue eyes. Um, blue eyes were thought to be an Aryan trait. The guys at the station said, oh, well, she's probably not Jewish, let her go. That was, uh, she could very well have been just taken off to Ponari for being out without her star. But she, that was the first time it came up heads. Uh, the next time uh, was not too long after she got to Kaiserwald. Uh, they were in a, uh, in a work party. Uh, they used to go out and, and collect scrap metal. It was, um, there was an electrical plant up there and there were some, some other uh, munitions plants, but they were, it was a lot of outdoor, really lousy work in the cold. Uh, in fact, they were, they were allowed to sew gloves for themselves out of burlap bags after they complained and the, the guards allowed them to do it. But early on, Mary wanted to die. She had lost her family, uh, she had rejected God, and she just wanted to die. So uh, while she was out in a work camp, in a work party, uh, she cut her hand and she said to the guard, my hand is cut, I want to go wash it in the river, okay? And he said, sure, go ahead. So she went down, walked out onto a pier and jumped into the river. And the guard saw her and he saw a couple of guys standing over yonder. He said, go pull her out. And they did. Um, these two guys happened to be chimney sweeps from, from Vilna, by the way. She knew that they were chimney sweeps, didn't know their names, but they, do they dived in, grabbed her by the shoes, leather shoes that her, uh, her father had made. Shortly before the ghetto was liquidated, he did make good heavy duty shoes um, for all of his kids. And she wore them. For some reason, they took her, her good clothing as soon as she got there, but they let her keep the shoes. And she wore them the whole time she was in captivity. But these guys fished her out by her feet. Uh, she had a near-death experience at that time, though. She said she saw all of her family as she was drowning and about to expire. She saw all the family. They were telling her, go back. Go back. And it was, she uh, came around to thinking that th there is a higher power that wants me to do something, and I, I have to survive. I can't die quite yet. Was there a hand up? That was, that was one time. So. Uh, that's, un that's one reason she's here. Now, uh, Kaiserwald was up in, in Riga. That's not too far from, from Russia. So they, when the Russian army starts to come back, in fact, they, they, um, they encircled so they, um, they couldn't uh, march or, or send people out on, uh, on rail cars. And they, they did need some people um, to be sent westward. So a couple of hundred of them were put in a rickety old boat and they made it to Stutthof which was right here. Sudhof is the first concentration camp that was made outside of Germany, uh, originally to um, uh, captivate, uh, to, to keep captive uh, Polish resistors and dissidents. It eventually became a killing camp. Later on in the war, they, uh, when refugees like Mary were streaming in from other camps uh, out in the east, they hadn't been killed yet, and the Nazis were sending them back. Sudhof got very big very quickly. Uh, they had only a small gas chamber there, however, and uh, 
it, Mary said that there was, they didn't do any work, they just kind of hung around and all you could smell was the stench of death. Killing was going on almost constantly. Uh, and then she uh, one day was lining up to go to the showers, which was the gas chamber. And it, it, they had, there had been showers there, but they converted it to gas. But it was a rather smallish building. And there was a capacity of 150 people. They were marching people in, and she was about to go in, and the guard said, stop, 150. And he shut the door. Oh. Everybody who was in died. She didn't. So, so that, it came up heads again. Um, there was another time, um, it w they, she wasn't at Studhoff very long, maybe a couple of months, and there, were, uh, there was a big shortage of labor in Magdeburg, which is a giant munitions plant. It had been making shells and, and shell casings for all of Germany's wars, you know, going back at least into the middle of the 19th century. A gigantic facility, they needed bodies there. So she and um, uh, some other people were shipped off on a train uh, to Magdeburg. But before she did, she was in the wrong line, once again. Um, and there was another, there was a lady who's, who I'm gonna meet, I'm gonna show you a picture of her, I'm gonna meet later. Her mother had taken kind of a shine to Mary. And uh, for, somehow she was able to retain at least one gold ruble on her person. So Mary's in the, in the wrong line and the, this, this woman um, takes out a gold ruble and, and gives it to the guard and says, let her come over into this line. And uh, the guy took it and uh, he said, okay, but Mary wouldn't go unless her girlfriends could go with her. And she, they were standing there for a few moments. She finally dragged her girlfriends into the, the good line it was not going to be selected for killing. And the guard just kind of stood there and it let, he let it go. If he'd been really doing his job, if he'd been enthusiastic, the coin would have come up tails. Once again, it came up heads. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's remarkable how this lady is still with us. About how old was she during that, like at this time? Was who was? How old is Mary in her 20s? Let's see, Mary was, um, she was born in 1924. Uh, so she would, she'd be early 20s, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, in Magdeburg, um, there was another, it, this probably wasn't a life-saving thing, but this, um, uh, there was this young soldier who was a guard there. And, and by this time, by the way, one of the things that was happening in the concentration camps is that they were, they were getting so big and there were so many people in them and they needed more and more guards a lot of times you could luck into not having the SS working your camp or they, it would be ordinary people mixed in with them. And uh, there was one young soldier who um, was a, a Wehrmacht guy. He, he rather liked, for some reason, Mary's friend Edith. And so he said, um, you never saw me? We never talked, but every day I'll leave you my sandwich right here by this, by this fence post. I'll leave you my lunch. So the uh, Edith was able to sneak out and get a hold of a really good uh, sandwich, share it with a bunch of her, her buddies. Mary got a piece, Edith's mother got a piece, Bella got a piece, Dora got a piece. And they were, I don't know if that was life-saving, but it certainly had to be another time that the coin uh, landed on heads for her. It had to be encouraging for them. Um, and, and Magdeburg was liberated. They, they also locked out in that Magdeburg was out in the West, it was liberated by the Americans. Uh, Mary did say that they were, um, uh, you could see off in the distance, they knew that the war was progressing. Uh, that you, could, you could see flames of the, uh, from, the, from the bombings, they could hear the guns off in the distance. When they saw the flames, she said they, they all danced around in, uh, in anticipation of their liberation. Uh, she also said that the, uh, many of the local families mothers and their children, particularly the German residents of the area, during those times would flock to the camp area, to the restricted area, and huddle themselves by the fence, knowing that, or thinking, that the Americans weren't going to bomb it. So this tells me that they knew what was going on. Okay. Um, she, uh, and then at the end of things, at uh, the end of the, um, uh, the camp in Magdeburg, the Germans were going to uh, march them off to, to some place. 
and, um, and Mary and her friends uh, lagged behind. They did not go to the stadium where a bunch of uh, people ended up getting killed, the, the local stadium. They ended up hiding. Mary hid in a cellar um, uh, of a family that, um, uh, they, that allowed her to stay there. You know, by this time, a lot of the local residents wanted to be seen as helping the Jews. So she, she was able to, to stay in a, in a cellar and she hid there for a day or two. Uh, her, her girlfriends were, were elsewhere. They had, she was reunited with them later. But she, was, she finally was persuaded to come out of the cellar. It's okay now, come on out. And the first thing she saw was a guy throwing cigarettes off a truck. That's where she started to smoke, actually. Uh, uh, and she, she smoked for some years. But uh, the Americans, uh, American soldiers were giving out cigarettes. They didn't have a lot of candy, so the cigarettes were, uh, were a pretty good quantity a pretty good commodity. Um, shortly after she got out, uh, how are we doing here? Shortly after um, she got out, um, members of the Jewish brigade were present, or, or there were Jewish soldiers. Uh, so he, she started talking with a Jewish guy. Are you Jewish? Do you have any friends in America? Any family in America? She did have an uncle, uh, Shmuel, I think, I'm not so sure sure if you, I'm saying that right, but her uncle uh, Sam had mi migrated to America in the 20s and had actually come back for a visit in the 1930s. And all that she knew was that he lived in Syracuse. He had taken the name, of the, uh, the surname of the woman he married, um, Cher. So all she said was, Sam Cher Syracuse, Sam Cher Syracuse. And the Jewish guy said, okay, we got it, that's enough. Shortly after that, um, when she was in a, a, a displaced persons camp, um, the family wired uh, $200 American to her, which was pretty big bucks in those days, and there was more, possibly more to come. Um, they were starting to live a normal life again. They could actually sleep in beds and had real food to eat. Um, one of the things that Mary always wanted was a handbag, a pocketbook. So they were out on the local town, and they... Um, when shopping for a pocketbook. She went in and picked one out that she thought she liked and, and she said to the, the merchant, how much is this? And the guy said, how much do you have? And she said, $200. She said, it costs $200. He took all of her money. That was a, that was a bitter lesson. Okay. Can I ask where on the map is Magdeburg? Magdeburg, it is near Buchenwald. It's, oh, a, um, okay. it's, it's in the western, the western sector. Okay. Um, and she ended up making it to, uh, uh, to Israel um, eventually and uh, was, was sent there on a ship. Um, here, this is Mary and her family. Uh, this is her little sister here. This is her. That's Bella. That's Dora. This is her father. Uh, undated photo. The, the, these pictures um, were actually... Uh, they didn't have any pictures that, that survived in Poland, but these were um, uh, the possessions of some relatives who had made it to Canada during the 20s and teens. Uh, they had actually had a few pictures uh, of them here. Um, that, that, was, that was taken in the 30s, actually. But the, the relatives in Canada had them anyway. That's how they were able to get a hold of them. Another thing that she had mentioned, that uh, when the shares came back for a visit, Uncle Sam came back in 1936, and they brought a lot of stuff with them and left it. You know, they left a lot of American clothing, <coughs> and they, Mary recalls uh, her her mother saying, oh, "What do these people think we are? They think we go around barefoot and think we don't have any clothing?" But the f folks in America thought that they were a lot worse off than they were. And at the time, they weren't, but it was going to get very much worse after that. Um, and the, um, another thing that Mary's mother said to her one time about um, uh, when the, the, the Russians had, uh, had taken over before the Germans came in, the Russians brought their women with them. And the, um, Mary's mother said, they, these Russian women wear their, wear their pajamas like nightgowns. That was, okay. So I see a quick question. Okay, this is Bella. Um, that's two summers ago, down in her uh, home in Long Island City, New York. 
She took my wife and me to, to lunch at this place. My wife, Mary Ellen, took that. She was an only child. Her father was the head representative for the Electrolux company in um, Lithuania. And her mother was actually the breadwinner of the family. She was a dentist. Uh, the, the father did make money, but business wasn't great in the 30s. Uh, and this is her, a very pretty young lady. Um, she met a guy, Max, in um, the first camp they were in and ended up marrying him. They stayed together. Um, and she, um, I, I wouldn't, she, she, as I said, she didn't want to talk a lot about her experiences, but I, I said, can you, can you tell me at least something about Mary that I can put down there? And she said that she was, uh, she saved my life. She was the responsible one. I, I wasn't. She knew how to talk to the guards. She knew how to sew. She knew how to make us look a little bit better when there were inspections. And um, I really owe my life to Mary, she said, which was, was pretty touching. And Bella always wanted to have Mary's blue eyes, too. But Bella was a, a, a very pretty young girl, as you, as you can see. She met her husband, Max, in, um, in Kaiserwald. Um, they ended up staying together. In fact, he was in all the camps they were uh, in as well. In Magdeburg, she really pushed the envelope by sneaking off to be with him at night. And uh, you know, Mary was a little bit afraid for her, but you know, nothing bad ever came of that. But they ended up getting married. He, they went to Bavaria. Uh, she went to Israel. He first went to America because he had relatives and she ended up joining him. Um, he was friends with another guy from Riga who lost all of his family in a big massacre uh, in the Rambola Forest, I believe is outside Riga. Uh, the Nazis came in during their first uh, sweep and they killed, I believe it was 21,000 people over the course of a couple of nights. Everybody in his family was killed uh, except Max's friend. So they went to America. Uh, Max's friend goes into business. He begins selling combs for women's hair and then sunglasses and other, you know, small ticket beauty items that ends up being Riviera sunglasses. He made many millions of dollars, retired a multimillionaire, um, built a surgical wing of a hospital in Tel Aviv and built a big memorial to his parents in Riga. And uh, Bella's husband worked for him and he made a very nice living. He, wasn't, he didn't own the company. But they, they lived in New York, and she still lives in a rent-controlled apartment in Long Island City. <laughs> She's been there since 1952. Uh, they were going to move downtown when they were doing pretty well. Then her husband got sick, and they decided not to. And it's a good thing they didn't, because she wouldn't be able to afford a, anything but a rent-controlled apartment. Now, she's a fascinating lady. She's very well-read. She's got all this beautiful art throughout her, her uh, apartment. It's, it's, just, it's a privilege to know people like that. Uh, here are some other things from Mary's um, time. This shows that she uh, worked at the uh, at Polta Magdeburg Section 1. The, the Polta Works was the munition works that she worked at. That's a certificate of participation, if you will. This is her uh, index card, Mary Tabahovich. That was her, her name. And this is her citizenship paper here. Um, when the, uh, the, the Jewish guys started talking with them after they were liberated. They told her to lie about where she was born. Um, if she said that she was born in uh, Vilna, she would have gone back and been under the jurisdiction of the Russians. So say you were born in Warsaw, and um, the, you know, you'll be under the jurisdiction of the Allies. So that's one of the few times that she lied. It says Warsaw here on her, uh, her citizenship papers. But that's, that's a lie, and that's OK. These are her cousins. This is uh, Abba Kovner and Beer Kovner, two, two very interesting guys who were, um, who both survived the war and who both became uh, important persons in the new state of Israel. Beer Kovner was Mary's first cousin. He was um, the one she was probably the closest to. He was a very bookish guy. Um, in fact, his, his mother didn't like how much he read so uh, Bear used to come over to their house and, and do all of his reading until late at night. Um, he was initially a Zionist along with Abba, but Bear for some reason uh, broke with uh, Zionism and decided he would become a communist. Uh, and he ended up, he was beaten up one time by some people, some local kids who he thought were his friends. They, 
they, they beat him up pretty badly and, and whacked him in the head with a piece of metal, permanently impaired his hearing. And that was the, inst the incident that convinced him that I, I don't have a future here, uh, I'm going to go to Israel. So he got out in 1938 and went to the University of Jerusalem, studied. Uh, he ended up being the head of the Communist Party in Israel. He was the youngest signer of the Israeli Declaration of Independence. And later on, when Mary's husband Mort was in the uh, uh, in a scientific um, uh, in scientific pursuits, his company uh, worked in, in conjunction with the American government. Mort had high security clearances. He would come back and forth to America, and he was deathly afraid that if Mary <coughs> were seen hanging around with her husband, he would lose his job and his security clearance because because uh, he was a big commie. And that was a that was a uh, fear that was, was well founded because of what we thought of, uh, of communism back in those days. He may very well have lost his job. Uh, Abba Kovner is the guy who organized the resistance. Uh, later on, uh, he decided he was going to be one of the relatively few Jewish people that took revenge uh, on the, the Germans. Uh, there's a uh, mention of a uh, History Channel film on the re reading list I gave you. Uh, the, the film uh, about him, uh, it has interviews of him and his buddies that they detail some of the plots that they concocted and it almost worked. Um, the first plot that uh, Abba decided, once he got to Israel, he decided he was going to poison the water supply in, in major cities in Germany and kill six million Germans. And they, he did reveal it to some people uh, in Israel and he, they were on a ship going back to Europe to, with cyanide in evaporated milk cans. Somebody ratted him out and he had to throw the stuff overboard. Um, he did tell Ben-Gurion about it. It was probably Ben-Gurion's henchman. Nobody really knows who ratted him out, but Ben-Gurion at that time was trying to build the state of Israel and make nice with the United Nations. And if something like that happened, it, it probably wouldn't have set very well. So Abba spent some time in jail, actually. Um, just to kind of keep him off the streets while the delicate negotiations were going on. But he, uh, he ended up being the poet laureate of Israel later on. He's, he's an artistic guy and, and quite a writer. But they did have a plan B for revenge. They decided that they would kill SS um, soldiers, SS commanders, and, and you know, second ranking people who were awaiting trial. So they, they decided that the way in to the prisons to kill them was through the bakeries that supplied them with bread. They got a bunch of the Confederates to work in bakeries that supplied four of the prison camps where the Nazis awaiting trial were held. Um, three of them, three of the plans didn't work out for whatever reason, either they were caught or they couldn't get inside and had cold feet. But in Nuremberg, um, one guy was able to hide uh, while the place closed. Another one came in after it was over and um, the loaves of bread were baked for one morning. Um, they painted 5,000 of them um, with cyanide, uh, 5,000 of the black bread. The white bread, they did not touch because they knew the Americans were going to eat the white bread. So they, the black bread was, uh, was given to the prisoners. And uh, how many they killed, they really don't know. It was probably three or 400 uh, were killed and, and uh, a, lot of them, a lot of others got sick. And the word that went around publicly was, you know, somebody tried to poison him and a bunch of guys got sick. So they, the, it, the incident was again played down, but Abba and his buddies did wreak some kind of revenge uh, after that. So, and we're almost out of time. I think, uh, let's see. I, maybe, I'll, I'll take up, I'll tell you about Mort next time. He's a very interesting guy, but this is, uh, this is Mary and Bear in Israel. Uh, he was the first guy to spring her uh, from a camp that she was, was, uh, was put in. When they got there, she was put, the first place she went was to a camp called Atlit, A-T-L-I-T, outside of Haifa. And it was, it was very much like a concentration camp um, and, until they decided what to, what to do with these, uh, these prisoners. Somebody um, threw a bag of supplies over to her, having seen her on the other side of the fence, and a prisoner ran and got it and took it away from her and had to be given, given to her again. But Bear was able to spring her out fairly quickly. Uh, they were also uh, very friendly with a uh, someone 
whose uh, daughter had been in the camps, but some other family members were already in Israel. The family that uh, owned the, the Wolf Schmidt Liquor um, uh, distributors, so the, the Wolf Schmidt Liquor Company, they were very wealthy. Mary talks about going to their house in Israel a few times, and she was, they actually had a refrigerator. She loved refrigerators for some reason. Refrigerators were wonderful. This is Bear signing the Declaration of Independence uh, with David Ben-Gurion. One other thing about Mary, um, when she initially got there to Israel, and for about the first year, um, she and her fellow prisoners were looked, greatly looked down upon by those who were already in Israel. Uh, they didn't really know what these folks had gone through. They disdained them for not fighting back. There was a cruel nickname, Sabonim, which means soaps, uh, which refers to the soap that was made from Jewish fat. That's a, that was a pretty cruel nickname. But they were, they were seen as damaged goods. And Mary ended up marrying Mort. There he is, that's their wedding. That, that's a, an unusual match, a non-survivor and a survivor. Um, they were, um, he was told not to marry her. He did anyway. It's good that he did. They had a great marriage. They've had, they have two lovely kids. Okay, and I, um, we are out of time. I'll take it up and tell you more story next time. And then, then we can get into, um, what else do we have here? Um, this here. Okay, but I will, I will tell you that the, when they ended up um, settling in Florida, uh, Mort had gone down to St. Petersburg for a job interview. And um, he, he took the interview because of the sunset in St. Petersburg. It reminded him of Tel Aviv. That's, that's why they went there. And here, by the way, this lady here is Edith. Uh, who was in the concentration camps with Mary. I am thrilled to let you know that after class next week, on Wednesday, I'm flying out to California to interview her. She's, um, she is willing to see me. She's not in great health, but she's okay, and she's of sound mind. She's willing to talk. I talked to her last week. May I come out to see you? And she said, sure. So that's, I, I can't wait to meet her. So that's it. Uh, How old is she? She's uh, 93 or 94. And this is, I mentioned a, the architectural dig I went to in Galilee. This is um, in Migdal. This is the oldest carved menorah in Israel. That's from the first century. This is the other side. Here are the chariots of fire. And I also got, on my trip, I got to uh, get rid of a bucket list item to go swimming in the Mediterranean. <laughs> and there I am. That says, Guns and Moses. <laughs> okay. Okay, so that's, we are out of time, thank you. Uh, we'll take up more next week. And I'd like to talk also about some of the, uh, survi the um, Righteous Among Nations, and then a little bit about telling the story today and how it's being told or how it's being not told in many cases. Okay, thank you all. Thank you.